December 19, 1979 was a Wednesday, and the new Westdale Mall, located in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, was bustling with holiday shoppers. While American malls are currently dying off, in many cases phased out due to a surge in online shopping, back in 1979, the mall was the place to be and be seen. Westdale Mall had just opened two months earlier on the southwest side of Cedar Rapids, following construction delays caused by the 1974 recession, zoning disputes, and an electrician strike. But once the long-awaited two-level complex finally debuted, it was brimming with shoppers and the large parking lot was filled to near capacity. This made it tough to snag a parking spot near any entrance, which may be the reason 18-year-old Michelle Martinko parked the family Buick Electra a good distance from the J.C. Penney department store. Her mother had given her $180 to pick up a new coat, and Michelle was happy to oblige. The mall was basically teen central, where kids would shop and hang out at the food court. On this particular evening, Michelle, known for her fashion-forward style, was dressed to stand out. It was the night of the school choir banquet at the Sheraton Hotel, and Michelle was a stunner in her favorite black dress, stiletto heels, and trendy white and brown rabbit fur coat. The thought of wearing real fur is pretty disturbing to me now, but rabbit furs were all the rage at that time. I recall my own silky black one, which made me feel so grown up and glamorous. I'm sure Michelle experienced the same sensation. Following the fancy affair, Michelle asked her friend Jane Hansen to go with her to the mall, but Jane had homework to finish and opted out. She could never have imagined how impactful that decision would become. Michelle Marie Martinko was born October 6, 1961, to parents Albert Martinko and the former Janet Zillig. Like me and my own sister Jan, there was a 12-year age difference between Michelle and her only sibling, Janelle. Like Michelle, I too was a flower girl in my big sister's wedding. The Martinko family had deemed their younger daughter their miracle baby. Mom Janet had suffered five miscarriages and was in her mid-40s when Janelle finally had a sibling. By 1979, Janelle was married and living in Davenport with her husband, John Stonebreaker. But she and Michelle were still very close, keeping in regular contact with handwritten letters, a notion that seems completely foreign in today's high-tech world. Michelle was a beautiful girl by anyone's standard, with her drill team figure and long mane of blonde hair. That feathered blonde hair was her signature, and it earned her the nickname Farrah, after Charlie's Angels star Farrah Fawcett. Upon first glance, one might assume that the beautiful Majorette was accustomed to getting lots of attention from her peers at Kennedy High School, but Michelle was actually somewhat reserved. She was a good student who performed in choir, theater, and twirling. But she didn't have a posse of girlfriends or a homecoming tiara. Some girls were jealous of Michelle's good looks and fashionable wardrobe, as well as her ease at turning all the boys' heads. She did have a few close friends in both genders, though, including Kurt Thomas and Jane Hansen. Jane described Michelle as a true girly girl. Friends Mike Wyrick and Gail McCammon Dawson recall Michelle as a compassionate girl who was kind to everyone, especially the outcasts. In middle school, Michelle had suffered with scoliosis, or curvature of the spine. She was forced to wear a back brace that ran from her neck to her hips, which made puberty for her even more complicated. According to Gail, Michelle was shy and did her best to fade into the background. Once the back brace came off during high school, however, Michelle blossomed. She allowed her light to shine, participating in school activities and dating. She had an active social life and dreamed of studying interior design at Iowa State University. Sadly, the ambitious girl with the fair hair would never get to fulfill her big dreams. Cut to Cedar Rapids, December 1979. At 2.30 a.m. on December 20th, Jane Hansen was roused from her sleep by a frantic call from Michelle's mother. Michelle had never returned from the mall. Jane had no idea where Michelle could be. Michelle's dad then phoned the police, who were unfazed. They didn't have the resources to chase down every teenager who missed curfew. After calling other friends, including Michelle's ex-boyfriend Andy, Janet finally phoned the police again and begged them to look for her dependable daughter. At 4 a.m., Officer Jim Kincaid was dispatched to the Westdale Mall. He located the gas-guzzling Buick in the far reaches of the parking lot, at least 100 yards from the J.C. Penney exit. 
He had trouble seeing through the windows, now frosted over. He breached the unlocked rear door, noting a woman slumped in the front passenger seat. He assumed she was sleeping off a bender, but when he opened the front car door and took a closer look, he found a dead young woman covered in blood. Shortly before dawn, Janelle Stonebreaker received a call from her mother, who was sobbing and hysterical. She had to come home to Cedar Rapids immediately. Little sister Michelle had been brutally murdered. It was Janelle who identified her sister's body, which had sustained 29 stab wounds to her face, neck, and chest. Cuts and bruises to her hands and arms made it evident the high school senior had put up a ferocious fight for her life. Investigators determined that Michelle had been killed inside the car. There was no evidence of robbery. Her small leather purse was there as well. There was no weapon found at the scene. She had not been sexually assaulted. But they didn't assume the killer was male. The frenzied attack could just as easily have been performed by a female who was likely known to the victim. Investigators believe the attack was personal, given the brutality and number of stab wounds. In addition to the blood inside the vehicle, there were gloved handprints on the windows. The palms of the gloves bore a striated pattern, like those found in rubber dishwashing gloves. Whoever had ambushed Michelle Martinko had planned the attack. Now investigators had to find out who could have wanted the student dead. On Thursday morning, Kurt Thomas was called to the principal's office. Kurt had not yet heard about Michelle's murder and had no idea why he was in trouble. He was interrogated about the events surrounding the previous day, starting with school. He recounted his routine school day and explained that after his classes, he reported to his job at Westdale Mall. He was on his break around 9 p.m. when he spied a stunning blonde in a fur jacket. It was Michelle, a fellow classmate he knew casually. He and Michelle walked through the mall and caught up. Then Kurt excused himself to return to work with a promise that he would keep in touch. The exchange ended with his walking Michelle Martinko to the mall exit around 9.25 p.m. Upon learning of Michelle's murder, Kurt was in shock. It quickly became apparent that he was likely the last person to see her before she left for her car. And he was aware that things were looking really, really bad for him. He was still trying to process it all when one of the detectives leaned in and demanded to know why Kurt had killed Michelle. The teenager was dumbstruck and scared to death. Fortunately, the detectives received a call from Kurt's boss at the mall. She explained that he had returned from his break on time around 9.30 and helped her close up for the night. The medical examiner had determined the time of death to be between 8 and 10 p.m. Kurt was dismissed as a suspect and allowed to return to his classroom. Next on the list was Michelle's former boyfriend, Andy Seidel. According to Michelle's brother-in-law, John, Andy was the obvious suspect. Since Michelle had broken up with him, citing that he was too possessive, he had taken to following her on dates and driving past her house. When questioned by authorities, Andy confirmed that he had been at the mall around 8.30 with a friend on the night of the 19th, with the intention of buying a Christmas present for Michelle. As one can imagine, this was very suspicious to detectives. He didn't help himself when he became so distraught at Michelle's funeral that he practically crawled into the casket with her, according to friend Gail. But they had nothing on Andy. His story never changed, and they were unable to find any evidence pointing to him as their killer. DNA testing was decades in the future, and the best science could do with the blood evidence was blood typing. Like so many others, Andy was questioned and released. But even after he left town to join the Navy, he was still viewed as the primary person of interest. Investigators followed over 200 leads from the community that turned up nothing. Then the case went cold. In the years that followed, the Martinko family endured painful victim shaming with accusations that Michelle was somehow responsible for her own demise. They were barraged with rumors of drug dealings and even prostitution, leading Michelle's mom Janet to become reclusive. But she never gave up hope that one day her daughter's killer would be found she quietly followed true crime news stories and waited for science to advance. Enter CODIS, or Combined DNA Index System. CODIS is a nationwide database of DNA collected from arrested offenders. In 2005, a cold case detective with a Cedar Rapids PD was reviewing the Martinko case file when he came upon what he believed to be the killer's blood. DNA testing had greatly advanced in the 26 years since Michelle's death and investigators were hopeful. 
Leading the case was Detective Doug Larison. Ironically, the investigator attended high school with Michelle Martinko, although she was just a casual acquaintance. Still, Larison felt a deep-rooted responsibility to find Michelle's killer. Also assigned to the case at that time was Detective Matt Denlinger. Matt was in kindergarten when Michelle was murdered, but he knew the case better than most. His father, Harvey, was now retired from the Cedar Rapids Police Department. He had worked on the case starting in December 1979. Now his cop kid was taking up the mantle to solve the case that had haunted investigators in the city of Cedar Rapids for decades. It was Larison who noted in the case file that another investigator had sent blood scrapings from the Buick's gear shift for testing, but had never followed up on the results. Larison followed up and learned that the blood contained male DNA. They sent it to CODIS for a review, but no suspect match was detected. Wah wah. Next, they sent Michelle's black dress, which had been carefully preserved, for examination. Again, they found a small trace of blood containing male DNA, and it matched the blood on the gear shift. But still, they didn't have a suspect. In fact, it would take more than a decade for a suspect to finally emerge. Detectives re-interviewed everyone from the original investigation and collected over 100 DNA samples, including that of ex-boyfriend Andy Seidel. It didn't match. Andy, who had lived for 26 years under a dark cloud of suspicion, was not their killer. Sadly, Michelle's parents both went to their graves believing he was. By 2015, Doug Larison was burned out and asked to be replaced as lead detective. Matt stepped in. He was on a mission to solve the case his dad had worked on so many years before. He was also aware of major advancements in DNA technology that could identify a suspect's eye color, hair color, and ethnic origin. He contacted Parabon Nano Labs, located in Virginia. They described their technology called Snapshot which basically analyzes DNA and creates a digital photograph of a suspect, or what they call giving a face to a phantom. Denlinger thought this was treading into sci-fi territory, but he was willing to give it a try. He wasn't disappointed. Nano Labs concluded that the suspect in Michelle's murder was likely a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes. They created three age-progressed renderings and shared them at a press conference, and they waited. They received hundreds of leads, or basically what Denlinger describes as, quote, every blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy that ever walked the face of the earth and stepped foot in Iowa. They followed the leads and grew frustrated as months passed with no viable suspect. Then, in 2018, an unrelated cold case was back in the news. The Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, was finally arrested after decades of terrorizing the state of California. The infamous serial killer was caught with the use of a new technology known as genetic genealogy. The system creates a DNA family tree, charting the DNA from one family member to relatives. Parabon offered to use the sample collected for the snapshot project in a new DNA examination. Using a national database called GEDmatch, Parabon examined samples from people who had voluntarily submitted their DNA to create personal family trees. In July 2019, Parabon reported that they had located a relative of Michelle Martinko's killer. Her name was Brandy Jennings, and she lived in Vancouver, Washington. Detectives traveled to interview Jennings, who provided relatives' names. Matt would use the names to painstakingly create a family tree, with the use of genealogical records, birth records, death records, and internet searches. Jennings' family members contributed their DNA for testing, and the tree continued to take shape. Cedar Rapids PD updated Parabon with their findings, and in October 2018, the scientists determined that the best suspects were three brothers who lived, where else, in Iowa. The phantom they had sought for nearly 40 years was practically living in their own backyard. They researched brothers Donald, Kenneth, and Jerry Burns, who were all still alive. Undercover detectives followed brothers Donald and Kenneth and secretly obtained their DNA from a straw and a toothbrush. Both were ruled out. Their DNA did not match the killer. That left Jerry. Jerry Lynn Burns was a respected businessman with a wife and family living 45 minutes away in the town of Manchester. He had no criminal record, nor did he have any connection to Michelle. He was 25 years old at the time of the homicide and his yearbook photo looked similar to the Parabon snapshot. 
Investigators staked Burns out at a restaurant and watched him drink several sodas. They covertly recovered a straw and tested it for DNA. It was a perfect match to the blood recovered inside the Martinko Buick. Denlinger decided to rattle Burns right out of the gate, so he chose December 19, 2018 as the day he would interview Burns at his workplace. It was the 39th anniversary of Michelle Martinko's murder. With a camera hidden in a travel mug, the detective confronted Jerry Burns with the DNA evidence, which pointed to him as the killer with astonishing accuracy. The odds of the killer being anyone but Jerry Burns were 100 billion to one. Burns' reaction to the accusation was flat. He remained calm and appeared undisturbed, never confirming or denying that he had murdered Michelle four decades before. As his office cat walked back and forth in front of the hidden camera, Jerry insisted they test the DNA, even when he was presented with the Parabon findings. He was arrested on the spot and bond was set at $5 million. His trial was originally scheduled for October 2019 and he faced life in prison. Lynn County District Attorney Mike Harris described the homicide as brutal, violent, and horrendous. Burns entered a plea of not guilty in January 2019. His family members rallied, insisting that Jerry was incapable of committing such a horrible crime. Regarding the DNA evidence, they cried foul. They insisted there had to be some sort of mistake, like an accidental transfer of Burns' DNA. Jerry had admitted to being at the Westdale Mall, but had no plausible explanation for his blood being found at the murder scene. The trial was delayed until February 2020, with a change of venue requested by Burns' legal team. Jury selection began at the Scott County Courthouse in Davenport on February 10th. The trial took just two weeks, and on February 24th, Jerry Lynn Burns, age 66, was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole in order to pay the Martinko estate $150,000. Janelle and John Stonebreaker expressed the gratitude of the Martinko family, noting the generations of dedicated investigators who worked to give Michelle justice. In June 2020, attorneys for Jerry Burns filed a motion for a new trial, citing that use of genealogy was unconstitutional and the search and seizure of the defendant's DNA violated the 4th and 14th Amendments. Defense counsel also took exception to the testimony of an inmate who recounted Burns telling him that regardless of the outcome, he wins because he had the opportunity to be with his family all these years. The inmate, Michael Allison, also stated that he was sickened by Burns when he joked that if Allison continued to beat him at Pinochle, he would, quote, take him to the mall. In December 2020, Burns denied allegations that he was also involved in the unsolved disappearance of Mason City, Iowa news anchor Jody Husentrude in 1995. Ironically, it was Burns himself who casually mentioned the Husentrude abduction in an interview, according to a CBS News report published in November 2020. In January 2021, Burns hired famed Making a Murderer attorney Kathleen Zellner to handle his appeal. The Chicago lawyer achieved national notoriety when she represented convicted murderer Stephen Avery, the subject of the Netflix documentary. Zellner argues that the lower court erred in allowing the warrantless extraction of Burns' DNA, claiming it violated his U.S. and Iowa constitutional rights. This litigation is ongoing, causing more heartache for Cedar Rapids and Michelle Martinka's loved ones. While they take comfort in the fact that Michelle's killer is finally behind bars after 40 years of freedom, many still suffer painful scars. Friend Kurt Thomas, the last to see Michelle before her ill-fated encounter with a killer, still suffers immense guilt. He was due back at work when he walked her to the mall exit, but he deeply regrets not seeing her safely to her car. Janelle credits baby sister Michelle with solving her own murder. The teenager fought valiantly for her life, resulting in Burns' DNA being found on both her dress and the car's gear shift. In March 2019, lead investigator Matt Denlinger made his retired dad proud when he was awarded Iowa's Officer of the Year by the Iowa Police Chiefs Association.